Oh, we didn't. Oh, you got the trivia game over there. You have the trivia yeah. game? Okay. What do you want? No, you can have it. I don't care. So, hey. Hello. Nobody's on yet. Nobody's on. All right. I see us, though. I s we're on. Are we green? We are. We're green. So flip it the other way, Ron. It doesn't. <laughs> Hi, hey, Sarah. Sarah. Are we green? Huh. You have to turn your volume down. No, I hear that. We're green. That's okay. It's not. It's annoying. It is, but... Did we go back yet? Uh, we're still green. I know. It's, oh, the leg. now we're not green. So here's the situation. Uh, we're backwards. Uh, because... When I flip the screen, uh, it makes us green. So, like, if I do this, I'm guessing you can't read that. I'm guessing that's back. Well, you could probably read it, but it's backwards. And here's what happens if I try to make us right. Oh, this is exciting. It is exciting. Well, I'm it's really an, irritated. I'm super irritated. We're, yes, you are green. We are green. We we're are. green. Now we're green again. Because when I push the button to flip the screen so that it's the right way so you can read things... Um, it goes green. So anyway, we're not going to be green, so flip it back. Well, maybe we should be green so that they can see us it's the right not, way. It's uh, not St. Patrick's Day. I think you'd rather have us uh, not green. And this bottle is like right in my face. Make this over. Right. And tip it down just a little bit. Make us the right color and tip us down. Well, now you, now you have to come closer. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Sorry, we're going to be backward tonight. Oh, how's everybody? Happy Friday. And I'm not even the one having the issues. It's Ron tonight, so. Happy Friday. <laughs> yeah, it is not. It's not Friday. I know it's not Friday. It feels like Friday because today was really a long day. Yes, it was. In a good way. Um, yeah, we had a good day. I took half a day off of work. And Ron's retired. I don't know if you all know that. Ron's retired. So I don't get any days off of work. None. <laughs> it's kind of true. So we tiled our bathroom. It was fun. We partially, we're remodeling our bathroom. So we partially tiled today. We tiled a lot. I have a, uh, um, I have a blister. It's backwards, but you can see it. I have a blister on the, in the middle of my hand from running the trowel. I think it's weird place for a blister. It's reminds me, wasn't there like a, a weird, um, like horror movie where somebody had like an I have no idea like an, an eye? eyeball in the middle of their Maybe. hand. It sounds like a horror movie. We it's... should move on. Let's move on. All right, you go. <laughs> We're gonna talk wine. Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us. So today's for Argentina. Uh, should I turn the glare up? My head is really bright. It's okay. So today's theme uh, for the tasting is Argentina. And we're starting. So we're starting. So a little bit about Argentina. We have three wines. Lorena's really in a hurry. I think it's because she's hungry. I am. We have not eaten today. As we, as I said, we were tiling and my hands hurt. And so... Do you have a blister too? No, but they're all red. They're all red. So, yeah. um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Argentina generally as a country. So obviously you know that Argentina is in South America. Uh, Argentina, you have a map. I think you have a map. I can show you the map, but of course it's backwards. So Sorry. when you hold your map up, it's not backwards to you. Anyway, it shouldn't be. If there is, you should see a doctor about that. Um, so Argentina is a, uh, a pretty substantially large country. The wine growing regions are really super cool, really super unique. And uh, one of the most important geographical features of the country that influence wine country is the Andes Mountains. Andes Mountains separate Chile and Argentina. Uh, they provide a lot of things. The vast majority of the wine regions in Argentina are located in the foothills of the Andes. So they're on the western portion of Argentina, the foothills of the Andes Mountains. And... Uh, the Andes provide a couple of things. They, number one, a rain shadow. So if you imagine weather systems in our part of the world pretty much run from west to east, and so that's where all the rain sort of moves in. And the Andes is a huge mountain range that creates a substantial rain block or it creates a rain shadow. So the, the weather formations carrying a lot of uh, moisture 
roll off of the ocean. Um, they sort of get caught up in the mountains, drop a lot of their rainfall in the mountains, and then when it gets to the other side, it's dry. So there's not a lot of rainfall on that side of the mountains. I think I read somewhere that it was uh, maybe upwards of 10 inches a year, which is pretty low. Um, if you looked at other wine areas of the world, let's say Washington, you've got the Cascade Mountains that create a huge rain shadow uh, so that the central part of the state of Washington and Walla Walla are very dry as well. Uh, so a lot of wine regions on the, um, the opposite wind side of the mountains. Mountains play a huge role in wine. Terroir in general does, but mountains are one of the many. And then the other thing that they do is because of the, the position of the vineyards being at a higher altitude, uh, they create a situation where there's a, and you've heard me say it on, over the tastings, a very uh, large diurnal temperature swing, diurnal day to night temperature swing. So it gets very warm uh, during the day and then cools off substantially at night, which really helps the vines, uh, especially nearing ripeness, retain a lot of acidity because the, the ripening characteristics of the vine sort of shut down during those cooler times. And so it retains that high acidity. As sugar in grapes rises, acid in grapes falls. So having the warm uh, daytime temperatures and sunlight allow the grapes to uh, really ripen up. And then that cool allows them to retain the acidity. Argentina as a a uh, wine growing country is, depending on what list you look at, I think we talked about this, either the fifth or sixth largest wine producing country in the world. Um, you mean when you say what list, you mean who's who, who's reporting? Well, so who's reporting also, okay. the most recent data suggests, as I've said here before, that China is really coming on strong. Yeah. And so they've taken over number five spot on many, many data lists and things. So you've got, in order of wine producing, Italy is number one. Oftentimes, they talk about Italy and Spain occasionally flip-flopping their positions. Uh, Italy, Spain, France, the United States, and then either China or Argentina. Again, sort of depending on the list, but they're right there sort of neck and neck for five and six. Um, what we're talking about, because I thought this is interesting and I wanted to make sure, are we still green on yours or no? No, that's, um, uh, I don't watch it live. Because okay. if I watch it live, it doesn't show me the comments right. and I want to be able to talk to people. So, but no, we are not. Keep going. Although this wine, for those who haven't smelled it yet, I hope you all have, uh, is a little green smelling, as in flowers. Very floral. Yeah, so because I know you're already drinking. I hope so. Uh, first wine is the Trevento, or uh, Aten vert backwards it's backwards oh. in the thing because i can't flip it without being green it's not easy being green as kermit the frog once said it is easy being cheesy it is easy being cheesy good one honey mm -hmm. where'd you hear that see sometimes i'm funny right sarah she's she's lorraine doesn't think she's funny and she's not wrong really <laughs> and when i am funny i like to say it because everybody needs to know it because it's a big deal so, Trevento, this is the White Orchid, uh, Reserve Tarantus. Tarantus is the grape, uh, but this is a blend. If you look at, I think you have a text sheet on this. A couple uh, people didn't get the text sheet, but I think we emailed it to them. Kelly, I think you're one. I did email it. Okay. I tried. Okay. So, if you don't um, have it It's not much of a text sheet because I actually kind of just made the text sheet up because I couldn't <laughs> find one. So, this is 85% Tarantus as the grape. 15% uh, Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris, remember we had a Pinot Gris um, from... Pacific Northwest. We yes, had, uh, the uh, Firesteed. Mm -hmm. We had the Firesteed Pinot Gris at one of the tastings. So this has 15% uh, Pinot Gris. It's from Mendoza province in Argentina. It scored uh, 88 points in uh, Wine Enthusiast. Um, so we can, we can taste this one and you can... Uh, shout out what it is that you smell, taste. We already have people commenting. Um, so if you're if you're really into wine and you start doing a little of the geeky stuff, you do blind tasting. And Ron and I have talked about how we do blinding together. 
he'll sit down on the couch or vice versa and we'll bring out a wine and we'll kind of test each other. If you smell flowers like this or um, like almost Fruit Loop flowers, <laughs> like Fruit Loops with a little floral in it, extremely distinctive Tarantas. This one's not as Fruit Loop as I usually get. I don't think it's quite as floral as I usually get. Yes, it could be because of the Pinot Gris. That makes sense. It has that little bit of blended in. Mm -hmm. And the Pinot Gris, I think, adds a little bit of uh, textural mouth characteristic to it. Let me see if the bottle tells us anything. And you have the bottle as well. Uh, nope, little tasty note. Uh, floral notes of white orchids, peaches, chamomile, uh, followed by delicate tropical fruits and citrus on the palate. This one actually doesn't have the acidity that I often get out of Torontos. Yes. Barb is getting a little, um, uh, I'm going to be a little bit more politically correct. Is it cat pee? <laughs> she might be getting a little catty out of it. She said urine. Urine. Um, catty is, of course, ref often um, a way that it, Sauvignon Blancs are described. And maybe that's what you're getting in here, a little bit of cattiness. Um, not, or maybe a better word or, or more palatable for some people who don't appreciate that word, which I actually don't have a problem with it. Uh, ammonia. That's maybe... And I would uh, pay attention. It might actually change a little bit, depending on how long you've had it open and how much uh, you've given uh, it some swirl. Uh, if you give it a lot of swirl, it may that may fade a little bit. May, may not. Um, so we talked about wine production. Let's talk about wine consumption for a second, and not the fact that we're all sitting here drinking on a Friday night. I know it's not Friday. Um, consumption overall, the list goes... The United States, yay United States. Uh, France, Italy, Germany, China, and the UK. However, uh, I think that's a little bit of a misnomer because we have a pretty big population. We're a pretty big country. So the fact that we consume the most wine sort of goes hand in hand, right? Uh, what I would prefer to see rise is the per capita consumption. So per capita consumption, countries in the world, Portugal, France, Italy, Switzerland, then the list goes on until you get down to number 15, the United States. We're number 15. Per capita? Yeah, and per so, capita wine consumption. But not alcohol. I didn't look up alcohol. Okay, that could be why. So. Well, yeah, because there's a lot of... We have a lot of good alcohols, too. Well, no. And we have a lot of people who just drink... Simple... Yeah. Beers or whatever. Right. You know. There's nothing wrong with that. That's very polite of you. That's there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, a little bit back to the uh, the wine. On the finish, I get a little sweet tart. Anybody else get sweet tart on the finish? So along with Ron having us green, we're not seeing your comments. So I'm only seeing them when I refresh on my iPad. Um, so be patient if I don't. We don't comment right away because Ron's Ron's having technical difficulties, not just me. I wonder why that is. Um, so we have a question, and it is. Oh, now I'm seeing. Oh, now we are. But uh, the question, it's about blends, um, and what do blends impart? Uh, that's very summarizing what it is. Um, can you talk about blends and how why we're big fans of blends and what blends do? And I think we've we've had similar questions, so people are still really trying to wrap their their you know head around blends. Is, does one percent make a difference? Uh, what? Why would they do that? Uh, so this one is, specifically is what else does Pinot Gris do to Torontos? I don't know what else Pinot Gris does to Torontos, uh, but perhaps what we're getting is um, in the Pinot Gris is um, it's lessening that floral a little bit. Maybe lessening the floral increases the um, all feel. Um, I also think, and it depends, you know, so the way that it's made and uh, the specific vineyard and the grapes that come from it um, may vary, but uh, you get a little bit of mouthfeel, maybe a little rounder, lusher mouthfeel with that Pinot Gris, which I think would diminish the acidity. And like I said, normally with Tarantas, I find them to be a little bit more acidic. I actually find them to be less acidic. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 less acidic than this? Um, less acidic. 
No, no, this is what I think this is a, what I would get. I find them to be less acidic than other white uh, grape varietals, like right. Sauvignon Blanc and whatever. So I think this is characteristic of what I normally get in Toronto. Okay. But keep going. You can give your opinion too. My opinion is your opinion. <laughs> you can be right too. We both can no. be right. We're not, you're not wrong in wine, by the way. What you get is what you get. Right. So you're not wrong, honey. Keep talking. Talk more about... Uh, blends in general. Blends. Mm -hmm. All right. Blends in general, although the question was what does Pinot Gris give to this? We kind of addressed that one already. A little bit. Realistically, um, to know what a blend or a, a, a one grape variety is going to provide to an overall blend, the way that you would want to taste are the individual varieties side by side and then start blending and seeing where the wine goes and what comes of the wine. So generally speaking, the way that I look at blends is that when you taste a 100% varietal, it has its standout characteristics uh, where that's what you smell, taste, uh, you, what you get from that grape. As soon as you start that, and, and part of that is in the flavors, in the mouthfeel, in the characteristics and how long it lasts, sometimes in the color and the clarity and the, the inkiness or not. Um, and I think each grape varietal might have a little deficiency. So there might be like a drop on your palate. It might not last as long. You might get more. You're saying no grape is perfect. No grape is, well, they're all perfect, but they all have their deficiencies, meaning they're not going to be 100% balanced across. So when I look at a blend, I look at a blend as providing the positives of th their variety to the blend. You wouldn't want to blend, in my opinion, two grapes that really present all the same exact thing, which they don't because they're different. And they sort of fill the holes and they provide a balanced mouthfeel across the board. And so I think blends really fill in the holes and uh, provide for a super um, beginning to end mouthfeel, sensation, taste profile, all those things. Sort of the best of all the worlds, all the grapes coming together. That's why I look at blends. Like America. The best of all the worlds coming together to America. So, um, I have an interesting comment. Um, smells sweet versus taste. Let's talk about sweetness. Why don't you talk about sweetness? You talk about sweetness. You talk about sweetness. You're, you're my sweetness. I know. Um, so, I think it's interesting when somebody says something that, or, uh, or describes something as though it smells sweet. Because sweet is one of the things that we can actually taste. What does sweet taste like? Um, what does sweet smell like? Normally, that means that it smells or tastes like something that we have tasted before that has sugar and we have been programmed, oops, sorry, our brains have been programmed to identify that thing and therefore we think of that as being sweet. So for example, if you bite a strawberry and or a raspberry and it's ripe, there's a lot of sweetness. There's sugar in that ripe fruit. And when you bite that, you taste the sweetness on your tongue. And yet all of the other stuff that goes into flavor, which remember is 75% olfactory, 75% once you smell, um, gives you an overall impression of the flavor of the strawberry or the raspberry. When you taste a wine and you say, when you say it tastes like strawberries or raspberries, but it's completely dry, you don't identify it as sweet because there's no sugar in it. So when you smell something and you say it smells sweet, it is smelling like something that you've experienced that has sugar and therefore in your brain, you're flipping the switch and you're saying it's sweet. Is this an opinion or is this fact? Is this my opinion? Yeah. No, no. Is this, an, uh, is this actually a study that you can't smell sweet or is this uh, your opinion? Well, it's my, it's my opinion based on... Um, 
I, I guess you can smell sugar. I mean, you could smell sugar. Yeah. But if you take raw sugar, what does it smell like? Like, like white sugar? sugar. Like white oh. sugar. What, is it, what does sugar smell like? Powdery? I don't know. Go, go grab the bag. Let's talk. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no. What okay, is sugar? now this is, remember, this is how you learn how to identify sex and taste. I don't think tastes. sugar has a smell. I think it smells powdery, but we'll, we'll experiment. Everybody else can go grab a bag of sugar and play along with Ron's game and see what yeah, you smell. Yeah, pure cane sugar. Okay, so we'll see. So I'm going to put a little bit in the cup. Please. Oh, he's going to be polite about it and not just bring the bag to the table. Go ahead and keep talking. So uh, let's see. Uh, the other things that people are getting in this is citrus, lemon. I agree with that. I think that's completely in here. I get a hint of sweetness in almost all, I mean, I'm sorry, not sweetness, a hint of citrus in almost all whites. Um, whether it's grapefruit or lemon or, or uh, orange, almost every white I get a little bit of citrus. So. Oh, we've got sugar now to play with sugar. And just so, so you all can see, it is sugar. You see, you're seeing it backwards because so we're not green. Smells like my hand lotion because it smells like nothing. It doesn't smell like anything. No. So this is sugar. It doesn't smell. Not even powdery. I was wrong about that. I don't think it smells like anything. It doesn't. So I don't think we smell sweet. I get that. And I think that when we smell a wine and we say it smells sweet, we're smelling the fruit that we know is sweet. sweet. Although I do agree. I also when I smell, absolutely, you can. I, I think, can. I, I. I would agree. If I were to smell this, I would say there's a little sweetness in it. So now, also know that if I put this in water or in alcohol, um, because in order for you to smell something, you have to be able to get. Uh, it has to evaporate. It has to go basically airborne in order for you to smell. So we're smelling like granulated sugar. Right. It doesn't smell like anything. If we add it to something, we might you smell. Might smell it. So a couple of interesting uh, questions. Um, one, somebody got honeysuckle. I agree. I totally can see that. Um, somebody's asking what country first started blending. Probably the very first wine ever produced they blended. <laughs> so it's probably, it, it, it was just inherent. Field blends. If you ever hear a term field blend um, when you're out in California or whatever, and they're like, it's a field blend, that is... Basically that there are several different varietals in that field and they just pick them and make their wine field blend is a very common term um, And I I think it's just the standard all along and I I would have to say varietally labeled probably is a more recent Recent being in the last 300 years or whatever I would think going back you everything was a field blend because remember Ron talked about how um, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is a cross between uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc. So that's probably what happened is varietals were identified and that's when when, when the, the technology and the, the knowledge was out there how to identify. That's when we started doing 100% varietals. Nobody knew what it was before other than maybe red and white. Well, how no, else do you know what a yeah, cab is? Yeah, years and years and years ago, but certainly in the 1700s, 1600s. Yeah, I said more yeah. recent history. Yeah. Certainly not in day one when wine was no. created or... No. Like not even created accidental. I don't even know if it was an accident. It probably was intentional, just like beer. Probably intentional. Well, it was a, it was a just like any tree, any, anything. It evolved into it evolved, and of course it had to be wine so that it didn't, uh, so people could drink it and it fermented, so it was drinkable and not rotted. Right. So, so I would say. And there were grapes way before there were wine. Yeah. So I would say day one was uh, everybody was blending. <laughs> but that being said, if we talk about the history of blends in uh, quote-unquote modern winemaking, the most famous regions in the world make blends. So the most famous, in my opinion, wine region in the world would be Bordeaux, France. Uh, so Bordeaux has very strict laws. You keep banging into you me. You keep banging into me. I'll move. Keep talking about Bordeaux. And uh, um, so they have very strict laws on what can be blended and how it's blended. And so in Bordeaux, uh, if you say you're drinking a, a Bordeaux, a red Bordeaux, it is a blend of two or more of the five permitted uh, varietals. So it's a very strict blending thing. If you go to Italy and you have what might be 
considered like a house wine. It might be more of a field blend style that Lorena's talking about. And historically, field blends played a much greater role because just your your farmers, your uh, people who had homesteads in the country would grow grapes and they would just pick all the grapes and ferment them together. And that's the wine that they got, what they got. They didn't have a refined thing. In today's day and age, they don't do, I mean, you'll hear the term field blend. It's not as common as I think it once was because now everybody's super scientific about We're it. Geeky like we are. Right. And they break out the varietals and they don't really put them together until the end when they're really going to blend them. But blending certainly either by uh, happenstance or by purpose has been around for hundreds of years. Good enough? Maybe. Good enough? Good enough? You tell me. So, all right. Should we move on to the next wine? What time is it? It's behind me today. So, so I did means... have a question about what's behind us, because uh, I think this is a new view for y'all. Um, that's our espresso machine, and next to our, our espresso machine is the grinder, the bean grinder. There's two of them, because uh, we grinder. have our own grinders, or our own beans that we grind, and then there's a little flowers. guest grinder. And <laughs> And flowers. Decorations. So, so there you go. That's or are you talking about that print? <laughs> no, they asked if it was a um, smoothie maker. They're not talking about the print. Oh. So, all right. Move on. Let's go to the next wine. And. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Clay. Hi, Elizabeth. All right. I saw Renee. I saw a bunch of people in here. A bunch of people. Yes. Um, so a little, you guys can move on to the second wine. I but uh, a little bit more about. Uh, Argentina as a wine growing region where I talk about how most of the grapes are grown in the Andes um, one of the things that's really interesting and I won't geek out like I did about rivers and and uh, um, water and ocean currents but the other thing we talked about ocean currents a couple weeks ago playing a huge role in uh, many many wine growing regions the other thing that plays a huge role are wind currents so if you google uh, wind currents you'd find a uh, a depiction of the earth and a whole bunch of wind currents that are really predominant in the way that they flow around and uh, in this is sort of from my wine education and one of the wind currents that we have to remember is the Zonda wind current which is Z-O-N-D-A and it's this really uh, heavy wind current like almost hurricane uh, force winds that blow into Argentina from the Andes and over the Andes um, and sort of down along the eastern portion of the Andes. And the only reason that's really important is because wind, like super high winds in wine growing regions, especially during the early season, so spring, during uh, uh, flowering and during fruit set, can really, really impact the eventual crop. So what happens is the grapes start to, uh, they bud out and they start to flower. And as they flower, that's when they're gonna their fruit is gonna get determined if you have a wind that comes over and blows all the flowers off your crop is going to be substantially diminished in the fall so the zonda winds are very impactful if they're super heavy in the spring that makes sense it makes total sense so can you also fix your thing because you're seeing not seeing comments you're just seeing other stuff so you're still not I don't, you're not still not where you're supposed to be so if you could fix that so um sarah has said that um, this month's white wine at Weston, oh, I'm sorry, at Wassa, is a field blend. It's actually labeled a field blend. It's by Stone's Throw, which is a Wisconsin winery, and they make wines uh, primarily out of California, or they, they bring the juice in from California, and that is a field blend this, uh, this go around. So if you can't get it, it's no big deal. I can't, and I'm annoyed because. Uh, Kelly, you're asking which wine is the second one. It would be the uh, Tamari. Nope, I was going to do that. Did you taste them? I didn't taste them. I did not taste them. Is that the way you poured them? I poured them this way. Do you want to do it the other way? I would think we'd do the Malbec before We're the doing other. the Malbec second, so my mistake. Here, I'll switch you around here. So that's just my guess. I haven't tasted them. I could be wrong. And I'll, I'll, So we've talked a little about tasting order before, and I'll tell you why I decided or why I think that we should do the Malbec first. Um, we do the white, obviously, white before red, um, and then we do dry before sweet, and then we do light before heavy. And I suspect because um, the uh, Tamari is a, uh, it's Malbec Cabernet Franc, correct? No, it's Cab, uh, 
I'm sorry, you're right. Yes, Malbec Cabernet Cab Franc, 8% yeah. Malbec. So I think that the straight Malbec is going to be a little bit softer mouthfeel, a little bit less serious, and I think the Tamari with the Cabernet Franc blended into it is going to have a little bit more structure, maybe a little more tannin structure, and so therefore I think we should taste that one last. So if, that's why we had this brief interlude. Wow, the Riccatelli is interesting. It is earthy. Wow. When we first poured it, it was before we got on, um, I told Rod it smelled like um, uh, wood. And I, I didn't mean oak, like the way you get like cast room smell, like wood, like stems, like tree, tree branches. Um, now, wow, not meat, but something savory, very mushroom, is it mushroom? I'm getting black olive on the right hand side. Yeah, I can see the black olive. So remember when you taste, you want to taste all around the opening of the glass. Right, left, up, down, all around. I, interesting. I want to see what everyone else is getting. I haven't tasted it. I'm just smelling it. I want to see what everyone else is getting on the nose. I'm getting savory, mushroomy, uh, earthy. Still a little wood, but not, not necessarily oak per se, like the way I, I think of traditional oak aging. It probably is from oak, but... I haven't seen anybody comment yet, but that's just, uh, I might be, my my iPad might be a little behind. So I'm going to uh, ramble on about Argentina real quick. Unless so, you have comments. Nope. Comments so far is, yes, uh, earthy and uh, forced. So the other thing interesting about a uh, little bit of wine um, geek stuff. Back in the mid to uh, third quarter 1800s, um, there was a root chocolate. 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 That's it. Total Somebody chocolate. say that, or is that you? No, that's what I said when I tasted you it. You don't like chocolate in your wine. I can deal with it. Oh, chocolate and cherry. Chocolate covered cherries. Only not sweet. More um, dark chocolate covered cherries. Dark chocolate or chocolate covered dark cherries? Both. Dark. It's something. It's dark. It's a I agree. It's dark, dark wine. It's, it's dark chocolate. Somebody said um, auto oil. So interesting because I also uh, am getting something from the Petrol family. And I don't know if you remember, it was last week or whenever one, one week we were talking about Petrol as a classification of, of smells uh, in wine. And I agree. There is something in here um, that is in my tar or, or something from the petrol family. I can't quite put my finger on it. Oil is interesting. I don't know if that's quite what I'm getting, but it's similar. So something from the petrol family, which is, again, a very appropriate taste. You know, we talked about Band-Aids and we talked about tire. That's what we were talking about. Tire Tires. is what we were talking about, I think, two weeks ago or whenever it was. Sometimes you get plastic. Sometimes you get Band-Aids. Sometimes you get baby diaper. Sometimes yeah. you get uh, tire, tar, um... So we've got people saying, yes, uh, leather, the auto oil, earthy, mushroom, dates. Dates. Oh. So like a dried fruit characteristic? Yes. Um, I would agree with I would agree with that. Yeah. So. Um, and also a little uh, spicy, um, um, like a clo not clove, not like a, a sweet spice, but something, not pepper. So when you, when you do your systematic tasting of wine, not only do you identify what you're tasting or smelling, but you rank it in its, I'll say, strength, in its power. So when you smell a wine, the aromas can be like light, medium, and pronounced. Um, and then, of course, it's what you taste or smell. I don't know if it's because I've been like on my knees, like smelling thin set all day. Doing our floor, like like we said earlier. So I get everything you're talking about. I don't think it's a pronounced nose, though. I think it's a light nose. Really? I yeah. think it's. Wow, I think there's a lot. You know, we got somebody else who said they got the oil. They got somebody who said they get new car. I think that's all that petrol characteristic. Um, 
I also get a little powdery, powdery smell. Something, um... You know, uh, loss of uh, smell is one of the symptoms of COVID. It's a good thing you're quarantining. 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 Corn whining. We're corn whining is what we're doing. You're corn... With you guys. Whining. Corn whining. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> no, but seriously, I don't... I get a lot on this. I get a lot. Mm. Did you taste it? I did. It's dark on the palate, too. temp myself. You should. You should temp yourself. Didn't you today? We have a little thing sitting over there. We temp every morning. Don't know, huh? Seems hot. Is it hot? Uh, yeah, and Kim also says that she gets a burning feel. Kim, that's that's alcohol, um, which it's probably an alcoholic wine, like higher in alcohol. Fourteen five. That's a little higher. Not for California. <laughs> but uh, so I don't think that's like super high. But if you're getting that sensation, um, it might mean that it's slightly out of balance. So something can be really high in alcohol, but totally balanced. Um, where you where it doesn't stand out, but if you're getting it and it uh, like really stands out, oh. might be a little out of balance. I love this comment. I love this comment. Barb is exactly uh, what wine does. Exactly. She said that she worked in an auto garage in college, and the mechanics didn't wash their hands, and then they made coffee, and that's exactly what it smells like. That is a memory. I love that comment. Dirty Mechanics Coffee Hands. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there is. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. You're right. I'm That's, not saying there, I love it when you drink wine and it takes you back to something. Yes. And college, I hope, was a great time. So I think that is a wonderful comment. And I totally can see it. Mm. I think it smells huge. And there's a lot. And by the way, I still get the fruit. It's just the fruit is not the prominent nose. Which is really so. This is this is my self commentary on uh, Malbecs uh, from Argentina and across the world. So we've been in the business for over 16 years now. We've had the shop for over 16 years. So we've tasted a few Malbecs over those years, right? And I think back. Uh, eight to ten years ago, and we've got some people on here who've been in the business as long or longer than we have. Um, I think that the Malbecs that made Argentina popular, where people are like, oh, I love Malbec, I love Malbec, were soft, fruity, easy drinking, um, bright, not what I would categorize as a serious wine. Like just nice, easy going Fruity wines, kind of like the Shiraz wines that made Australia popular. In the wine business, we refer to them as critter wines because every freaking label that you saw from that, but from that colored appendage off of the behind, I won't name the wine, was some weird critter on the label, and it was fruit forward bright fruit fresh young and not anything like the history of the grape that was in the wine so malbecs from argentina were easy fruit driven wines when malbecs from france in the cohors region and from bordeaux were serious earthy complex clovey spicy i think that's what this is that's what this wine is yes so we've got people saying they're getting the cloves, which I had actually mentioned earlier. The other thing, um, I said I got chocolate. Sarah says she gets uh, carob, which I can totally see that. But we do have an You mean those little fat uh, angels cherub. with the... Oh, oh not cherub. Um, Mark wants to know what does it mean, because on the sheet it says bleeding 15%. Uh, so let me look at the sheet. I think I'm... Guessing you know what that means. I do. Yeah. So. I was gonna make some stupid joke, but he's it's like Mark it's like blood bloodletting. He's thinking of how to be funny. So 
I generally think he's funny. Um, so what that probably does. So when they when you make wine, you bring the. I'll just talk about red wine because that's what they're talking. Remember we had a rosé and I talked about how rosés are made. So you bring the grapes in, you uh, de-stem them. So you take the stems off of them and you take off, uh, you, you hand sort them or whatever and you remove the mog. Mog, M-O-G, material other than grapes. You put them into a fermenter. And if, let's say for example, um, there's too much water in the grapes. Uh, you had some late rain in the year or there's just it's just not uh, concentrated enough. You put the juice into the big fermentation vat and you want to concentrate the flavors. You basically open the tap, you bleed off a bunch of the juice, and it concentrates the remaining juice so that you have a higher skin to juice ratio. So you take away some of the juice, leaving a smaller percentage of juice, but the same amount of skins, and let that skin impact and influence the remaining juice. It concentrates the flavors and creates a, a larger impact of the skins. In rosés, you and they may have made a rosé wine from this. In fact, we had we had their Hay Rosé. So this is the same winery, uh, read backwards, that made the Hay Rosé Malbec. So it would not surprise me if the rosé from these same grapes, or the, the juice, the 15% bleed, was made into the rosé, and then this is the remaining mm. uh, Malbec. He's making that up, but that very well could be. What do you mean I'm making it up? You don't know that. I'm I'm creating an educated, informed. You are. You are. It is educated and informed, but process. it's not fact. So please don't just go say that. Well, it's not fiction. No. <laughs> that's the way that rosés are made, and that's that what is. happened with this. They bled off fifteen percent of the juice, and that's why it's wouldn't... on there. Oh, look at that! He so, drew all the dots. So if I were making things up, they'd be way more fanciful than. So somebody wants to know about egg whites. Can you please go into egg whites? So an egg has the yolk. Uh, so egg whites. So uh, I think like back in episode one, which was like a year and a half ago, wasn't it? Feels like Feels it. Feels like it. Not because of this. This is actually no, my highlight of great. my day today. Um, but That's because you're drinking. Right. So anyway, fine. So oh, I'm sorry, you didn't get that far. No, but you, go ahead. You do no, it. No, you go ahead. No, you do it. You go. Go. You go. go. Um, so egg whites are used. There's a, a bunch of different materials that are used to uh, fine a wine. And so in wine... Filter slash fine. Nope. They're two different things. Well, at least it helps people understand what you're doing. But they're two different things. Okay, fine. So when you read a wine label, it might say uh, filtered and fined or unfiltered and unfined. So filtering removes like bigger stuff and it's actually like a fibrous filter that they push the wine through. Fining removes certain things from the wine and it's done by adding a substance actually to the liquid that floats through the wine and will coagulate things out of the wine and drop it down. So it's maybe a little tannin, maybe a little pigment, maybe some other things. And egg whites is one of the things that they'll use as a fining agent. The other thing they use is isinglass, which is fish bladder. They use uh, diatomaceous earth. They'll use some other things. But that's why it says it's egg white. Is uh, It's fine with egg white. Which you could take into a whole, is this uh, vegan or not vegan? And so if we have people who are looking for vegan wines, we have to figure out if it's fine with egg whites or earth. That gets really, really... Difficult because you can't find that information all the place. It just so happens that this one said it. Right. So finding and filtering, they're different, but they're somewhat the same. So stop it. It takes things out of the wine. So does my belly. <laughs> well, no, I should. Your that, glass takes That takes things, things out. out of my glass. Yes. So anyway, so hopefully that helped with that. All right. So chocolate, 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 chocolate. That is exactly what I get in here. Chocolate. I think it's interesting. I did not fortunately get um, uh, olive, black olive on the, the taste, on the palate. It's getting more clovey now that it's opened up. Chocolate, 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 chocolate. That's all I get. And the tannins are building. Well, tannins build, as you know. 
So, as we talked about, tannins build. The more you drink, the more the tannins build. So, but yes, I agree. It's getting so interesting wine. Are we? Are we moving on to the next? Yeah, uh, sure. We probably should. We we have fifteen minutes here, honey. We have as much time as I want to take. You can go and watch TV. I'm just gonna hang on and eat. I'm gonna eat. I'm gonna drink with these people. They appreciate me more than you do. I appreciate you a great deal. I know you do. A great yeah. deal. I was teasing. They appreciate me almost as much in a much different way. In a different way. I'm not tiling their bathroom floor. <laughs> That's true. Although That's true. I could. I can tile your bathroom floor. <laughs> so. When I'm done with hers. Yes. As well as the rest of the bathroom. So you put this right in front of my face again. I'm moving that out of the way. I don't like that. So once again, I think this is, uh, if you're a big like Argentina Malbec fan, I think this is a more serious Malbec based that it's not just all fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, going back to sort of that analogy of Australia during the critter wine f phase when everything was all about the animal on the label, Shiraz, same grape as Syrah, a very well entrenched grape in Rhone and France and other places where it's a serious complex uh wine those critter labels are not representative of what the grape is and should be in my opinion and the opinion of people who know a hell of a lot more about wine than i do yes all right so um the other thing if you hear the word cohors referred to a grape that's malbec so um i would say this is a cohors style which is Cohors is uh, what they call it in France. Not only, but it's a, it's a region. region. It's a region. So Cohors, C A H O R S. So the red wines of Co the Cohors region are pretty much all just. I think Malbec is the only thing I've ever seen from Cohors. So Sarah actually had this with chocolate, and she said it was very good. So thank you, Sarah. For chocolate that. tahini brownies. I yeah. I'm not sure about the teeny part, <laughs> but the chocolate brownies part sounds really good. And yes, I'm hangry. Somebody said I might be a little hangry. We didn't eat today. We were tiling the bathroom floor. See? Omad. What's that? Omad. Okay. What One meal it? a day. That's what Ron's doing. Omad. I'm not. <laughs> Let's move on to the tamari because I'm very... So I'm not Omad, which would be one wine a day. What is this? That's the tamari. Okay, let's move on. All right. <sighs> She's always rushing me. I am not. So I'm going to talk one more thing about, one more geek thing about uh, Argentina. Um, so in the wine world, as I started to say, uh, back in like the 1800s, there's a root louse. It's called phylloxera. And it's, it's a, uh, a little bug that is native to the United States. So I know a lot of times I say, Ron, move forward. But this is a really important part of wine history well yeah it almost i mean this it, is a huge part of wine it history. did devastate european it decimated wine pretty it much decimated yeah. yes so this is a cool thing uh so phylloxia it's a little root louse uh louse like a bad guy a little bug that um will uh it, so it's native to the united states in the united states the grape uh varieties the families are not the same that make fine wines so Vitis vinifera are the fine wine grapes of the world. The Cabernets, the Torontos, the Malbecs, the Cabernet Francs, the Pinot Noir, all of those. That's Vitis vinifera. In the United States, we have Vitis Labrusco, Vitis Riparia, and I think one or two more. And those grapes are resistant to the root loss because, of course, evolution. And in the United States, if you've got a grapevine that can't survive a bug, it doesn't survive. So only those that are resistant to that bug survive. So what happens back in the mid 1800s is somebody takes some American rootstock and goes over to and vines and goes over to Europe and they introduce the, this root loss, phylloxera. And what phylloxera does is it eats and it bites on the, the roots of the grapevines. It creates scars so that bacteria and other things can infect it and it kills the vine. So this root louse was introduced to Europe almost single-handedly from a root louse. What are you doing? 
We have a comment on how you match. Keep going. Talk, match. About, talk about the root loss. Well, you interrupted me by talking about my matchy watch. I wasn't. Kristen was. Um, yeah, so my Fitbit band matches. It wasn't intentional, but... So you're lost. So the root loss almost decimates and really does decimate like a tremendous amount of vines in France and Italy and every place in Europe. So uh, in the U.S., it doesn't kill the the native ones, but it starts killing the Vitis vinifera vines that are being planted. So what they figure out is that they can take the head, like the above ground stuff from Vitis vinifera, which makes all the great wines we drink, and they can graft it, they can splice it onto the rootstock of Vitis riparia, Vitis lambrusco, mostly riparia, American rootstock and plant it, and that rootstock is resistant to the root loss of phylloxera, and then it can grow the vinifera still. So they save, after almost killing, they save uh, European wine world. This, go, this goes on worldwide. However, there's a couple of things that phylloxera, the little louse, doesn't like. It doesn't like sandy soil um, because if you can imagine if you're at the beach and you get sand in the places that the sun doesn't shine, that's kind of the way that the root louse feels about sand. When it crawls through sand, it's painful, it doesn't like it, so it doesn't exist, it doesn't thrive in sandy soils. The other thing that is uh, important is that if vines were not introduced, if American vines were not introduced, the root louse wasn't taken to those countries. So there are a couple of places in the world where phylloxera didn't impact. And Argentina, bringing this all the way around back to our tasting, Argentina is one of those places where you didn't get a high incidence of phylloxera. Chile and Argentina both. And it's because of the trade, because of what was going on in the wine industry, and because of their strict import-export laws, even way back then. Um, and it's sort of like weird proximity to the rest of the world's trading routes. So they have native rootstock. So they have native Isn't rootstock. Isn't that cool? So Bringing they have, it all back around. They have around on. grapes that are on the Vitis vinifera rootstock. Which is a very, very cool story. So next week we'll talk about that again. See how many of you remember Ron's story. And to make this more modern day, if you ever go to the nursery and you look at apple trees or anything like that, and they've got this little knotty oh. uh, nut down close to the base of the tree, it's because the tree has been grafted onto a rootstock. And now you would understand, if you've ever heard me talk about planting grapes, how it's like a Mr. Potato Head. Oh. So I don't know how to spell Barb, sorry, phylloxera. P-H-Y-L-O-X-E-R-A. Really important in the wine industry, wine world, really important. So moving on to the tamari. Yes, Sarah, I think on the nose I got the same thing you got. She got a little plastic initially. Which would be petrol. Which would be the petrol characteristic, which we also got in the Riccatelli, which I think is very interesting. All right, so, um, you know, I missed talking about the Riccatelli because I was blathering on about other stuff. Uh, the Riccatelli, the Malbec, 100% of the Going wine. Going back to aged, the one we had just now, not Asian the Asian French tamari. oak barrels for 12 months. Uh, so you've got 12 months oak aging in French oak. French does not impart as much as American oak. Um, the other thing I want to address, so somebody asked about egg whites because it's on the tasting sheet. This tasting sheet says drinkable from 2013 to 2018. Uh, oftentimes I find that winery notes, when they talk about, and even sometimes critic notes, when they talk about when something should be uh, drinkable, like drink now through this or from this to this time, what you do with these, because if it still drinks good, it's still good. And the Riccatelli, it's 2020, that's a 2018. Wow, that was a, that's a pricey wine to not age for at least. Yeah, that's dumb. Yeah. It's still, there's still tannin, there's still complexity, still there's still everything. Still good. So. Drink through 2022 at least. 
let's move on to the tamari, as I've been saying. Um, so, all right. we have uh, five minutes plus, because people will listen to you longer. I told you. You can start the pizza. We're having pizza again. Again? <laughs> Seriously, we weren't going to. We were going to have salad. We were going to have sa Well, we had a huge salad last night. But my hands hurt. And so it hurt to cut. And I also was cutting it even to shower. I had a shower because I was covered in thin set. Covered so in thin set. We, uh, so when we're, we work all day on the bathroom floor, and then we taste for three hours with you people. Um, uh, we want to make dinner easy. Mark did say that the notes are for the 2011, and we're drinking the 2014. Oh. So excellent point, Mark. Thank you. Yes. And Diane, I would agree with you. I think it um, the tamari tastes better than it smells. I would agree. So 2011, they said 2018, so seven years. We're drinking the 14, so that puts us at 21. 21. So I Ron said 22. said 22. Okay, you're not just pretty. I don't just make shit up. Yes. Sometimes I'm spot on. Sometimes you are. Rarely. Rarely. Thanks, Mark, for pointing that out. And I was had to just grew about this big. So. I know you've always got my back, Mark. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. All right, so Malbec Cabernet Franc. So we've talked about Malbec ad nauseum. Let's talk about Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc, just like Malbec, one of the five Bordeaux varietals. So very Bordeaux-centric blend, Malbec Cab Franc. Um, yeah, Yuko Valley, 80% Malbec, 20% Cabernet Franc. So Malbec is going to be the predominant uh, thing. Machine harvested in small batches. So I'll go back uh, a little bit, and this is a 2016. So my tasting notes 2016, wine 2016. Um, and you were right this time. My apologies for screwing up the tasting sheet, not getting you the the actual ones. They're probably made the same way. And oftentimes that's because I can't find them. Uh, machine harvested. If you look at anything that's harvested, anything uh, machine versus man. Uh, um, hand harvested, more expensive, labor more expensive, also more discerning, and oftentimes uh, in, grown in places that it's easier to hand harvest rather than driving a big tractor down the uh, middle of the lanes. And curiously, if you want to look at uh, uh, wine harvesting tractors, Google Lamborghini, yes. Lamborghini uh, grape harvesting tractors. They do I don't like, know if they started in tractors, but they moved into tractors, or what's the connection there? I'm not sure. But they do, we've seen Lamborghini tractors. I don't think they do it at like 100 miles an hour, but that'd be cool. <laughs> Ron's always asking me to buy a tractor. I keep saying no. I want to buy a tractor. I don't, want to, I don't even want a Lamborghini tractor. <laughs> that'd be more interesting. Okay, can I buy a Lamborghini tractor? No, no absolutely not. So. Um... Fermentation takes place in concrete vats for seven days. So we talked about concrete vats. We did last week. Well, we talked about concrete a number of times. Concrete in the ground. We talked about things that wine is fermented in. So it's fermented in oak. We've seen that a lot. It's fermented in stainless steel. Fermented in concrete. And um, with that, uh, concrete does not impart much as far as when you ferment wine. It uh, doesn't add a lot to it. It's neutral. That's Fairly neutral. Fairly neutral. And then maceration is carried out for four days, 14 days. What is maceration, please? So maceration is just basically a soaking of the juice and the skins. Um, it can be done as a pre-soak. When I say pre-soak, it can be done pre-fermentation. So that is done to extract things. All right, so this is getting too geeky. So when fermentation takes place, Apologies, I shouldn't have said anything. there's a lot of heat that's created. So heat pulls a lot of things from the skins that a simple cold soak won't do. So a cold soak will not pull the things out of the skins that... It's like making soup. It's cooking. Right. And fermentation, they, they'll often say that fermentation, the heat, will extract harsher tannins and harsher things. But the, it's a similar the less nuanced, to but it's a similar, similar, yeah, absolutely. So maceration is uh, soaking. They can so they can do a, a a cold soak, meaning cold, meaning before fermentation. Then they do fermentation. Then they can do a, a soak after fermentation. It just draws more from the skin. So color and tannin 
and uh, other stuff from the skins. All right. Good enough? Good. All right. All right. And then it's 60% uh, of the wine was aged in American and French oak for four months. You've hit your time. Ron is at 801. So See ya. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> we won't just shut you off. So if anybody has any comments or questions, if they want to talk about this wine. Let's talk about this wine because yeah. I haven't talked about Let's it. Let's talk about this wine. Please have at it. I like it. Um, differently than the Riccatelli. The Riccatelli was very thick to me. Very heavy. And you've you've kind of heard me talk about it. I get that with Syrahs, the heaviness. And I don't necessarily like the heaviness. I thought the Riccatelli was heavy. Um, this, surprisingly, seems a little... Um, green. Ron, Ron, Ron said green. I was going to say um, easy. Easy? Like easy drinking? A little simpler? Which is why I would have necessarily reversed them. But that doesn't mean we did things wrong. But it's, it's a little simpler wine. It's nice. It's good. I forget the price points. Um, $17.99 on the uh, Tamari. $35.99 on the... Yeah, we should have done the other way. You were right. I was wrong. She was right. Always. Should have done the Riccatelli last. We should have. But that's okay. It's a little more serious. It's a little bigger. I bet you still have wine in your bottles. Go backwards. I just did. And? What'd you find? Um. Did we? What? Okay, somebody wants to know if we met over a bottle of wine. No. Ron is a convert. We met... We met on the job, but not the wine job. Not the wine job. We met on the job, but not the wine job. So, no, unfortunately, we did not meet on a bottle over a bottle of wine. Oh, Elaine is thinking she gets a little more cab out of the... Oh, Cab Franc? So, it's Cab Franc, not Cabernet. Sauvignon Blanc. But or, they're uh, but they're related. They are related. Because remember, uh, Cab Franc is dad. <laughs> Cab Franc is dad. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is mom. And they developed Cabernet Sauvignon. Mom and dad. Yeah, Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. yeah. Sauvignon Blanc is mom. Cabernet Franc is dad. Out comes Why does it have to be mom and dad? Why, makes, why does the white have sense? to be mom? Because it's softer and easier and, and prettier. <laughs> And that big and bold and tannic and... Oh, that just reminded me of Kira. Big up, she always does this. <laughs> All right. All right. Reading comments. Um, I think you've pretty much hit all of them. Barb said something about a competitive set. What the hell is a competitive set? Okay, Barb, we want to know. Explain your... Oh, she's back. Barb, what does competitive set mean? If there were a question mark, I'd question mark you. So, Barb's probably just thinking about like racing, like running, because she's competitive. <laughs> Extremely. So, uh, we talked about Barb and Mark we already, did. because we talked about the newsletter and all that. So, Barb don't is... Don't give away all our secrets. That's for her secrets. Well, I don't know all of oh, her secrets. Oh, you know, so interesting. Drinking this again, I just got a little bit more um, savory. Than I got initially. So I got a little, um, not quite clove, but a little more interesting than just big old fruit bomb, which I got initially. I got just more fruit. Now I'm getting a little more savory. I think it's good. Yeah. I agree. It's good. I right, savory. I get a little, uh, the Cabernet Franc to me adds a little bit of a, a stemmy, not green like a vegetable. You said green initially. Yeah, more of a stemmy, stemmy, earthy green. Not like a... You said not vegetal or like vegetal? Not vegetal. So not like green pepper, which I don't like in wine. This is... I get the green. So I smell green. I know we don't smell green, but I smell green and I do smell green. And you're right, it's probably more stemminess. Stem. I did get... I don't know if you remember Stem me leaf. talking about getting uh, woody, which... Stemmy in the Riccatelli too. It was not quite stemmy, but woody. So there's... there's... Like from Toy Story? <laughs> nice. So. All right, Ron, you it are at like 805. Tom it smells like Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks it is. You are at 805, so time for you race you. <laughs> She's going to race you and see what you get. 
Who wins? You're going to win, Barb. I guarantee it. Race race me oh, for what? But maybe not when it comes to drinking wine. Well, I could never run the distances that Barb Absolutely runs. not. But I might be able to beat her at a, at a like a, a sprint. A so very short sprint. It's on the tasting sheet. What is? The competitiveness. Oh, the competitive set. Okay, so <laughs> there's your backwards tasting sheet. So occasionally I get really good uh, wine notes that are meant from a consumer standpoint. Sometimes I get uh, wine notes that are meant for trade people only. So for example, if I'm a salesperson of Tamari, I would get this and I would be able to say, oh, so the competitive set of this wine is Alamos, Gascon, and Deceno. So I would know to sell this wine against those brands. So if I went into an account and I said, oh, I see you have the Alamos, I, have you, I see you have the Gascon, this fits great in those, and this is a better blend. This is a better wine than those. So it's a brand specific note on this tasting sheet that is very specific to the trade. So if I was a wine sales rep, and we have a couple of them on here probably, I would know which wine category that this fits in and what the competitor wines are. So ignore it. That's the competitive set. Ignore it for your purposes. I ignore it for my purposes. Um, it also says, up here, and it's backwards. Up here, right above the bottle, it says Stelvin Closure. Again, it's a screw cap. So as a wine rep, I would want to point out, oh, it's an easy open Stelvin Closure. So sometimes these things are really good. Sometimes they... Well, they're really good for what they are. They're tech sheets generally designed for trade. Right. 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 And so they sort of like give a sales rep the tools that they need to sell the wine. So, All right. I think we are nearing our end. I just want one comment here. Um, my best friend is on, and she reminded me that she introduced me to wine, not you. And I introduced Ron to wine. Think about that. That is accurate. Thank goodness for Kelly. Ron says thank goodness for me and Kelly. Um... You probably introduced me to fine wine. I mean, it's not like I didn't know anything about wine. but He didn't know anything about wine. Neither did I. I'm not saying I did. So so the shop really introduced us to wine. It did. So when we bought the shop and we started the shop, uh, I drank beer. And I, I mean, I drank at the time what I thought was decent beer. I was never at like a Bud Light, Miller Light. It was only after the shop. And we sat down. We bought the shop in November of 2003. In December, January, we sat down with our first wine sales rep. And I don't know if it was Victoria or was it Kathy? I don't know. We're going back way too far. Long time ago. And we made our first purchase for the shop of six wines, nine mm -hmm. wines, six wines, I think. So six different wines. And that was the first time we did any sort of formal tasting sit down. Crazy, crazy times. Uh, since then, we have tasted a lot. Yes. We've drunk a lot. We've traveled a lot. We were supposed to be in France right now, today. We're supposed to be in France. We are not, clearly not. We're enjoying wine with you. Um, we are going to sign off very soon. But don't forget, next week is um, another event. And then two weeks from tonight is our Dusted Valley tasting with Corey from Dusted Valley, one of the winemakers slash owners. And uh, we've got several of his wines available for purchase. We're going to be talking about three. Stop into either Vino store. You'll get all three. Um, so next week, uh, just like this week, we're having technical difficulties. Next week, I'm going to try out the platform. That we're going to use for the tasting with Corey from Dustin Valley. Because he's going to be side by side. I right. will not be involved with that tasting, except for to say hello to y'all. Well, you can sit next to me. You can sit on my lap. Oh, that's nice, Sit on my lap. That's nice, honey. Um, and uh, so next week I'm going to try out that technology so that I don't screw it up for when Corey's actually on. I was going to do it today, but tiling. 
got in the way. Thailand got in the way. Thailand so. got in the way a lot. Yes. Um, we really appreciate everybody joining. Uh, thank you for continuing to stop in and buy the wines and shop at the shops. Um, if anybody's looking for something special, please definitely check us out. Ask me. Send us an email. Uh, message us on Facebook. We try to respond and, and we'll try to find wines for you. Yes. And uh, we'll see you next week. We'll be here for you. See you next week. Next week we're, we're doing uh, the King Chacho or whatever. We're doing King Chacho. I don't know anything about this wine. I'm a little... We're doing... Uh... I don't even know, honey. You're asking me. I've had, I've had drinks of three wines now. My mind is fogged. It's done. I'm done. I have all of them set aside. We we're, selling, we're selling the tasting sets for next week and for the Dust Valley already in the store. So you can buy two weeks ahead. Yes. All right. Pizza. Pizza, here we come. Thank you very much. Have a Thank great you. night. Good night. Cheers. Um, we'll see you stay over healthy. the course of the week. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Definitely stay healthy. And uh, Step in and see us because... Uh, we need you. Yeah, we do. We do. And you need us. I mean, <laughs> clearly, you need us. Yes. Good night. <laughs>